prologue and planning, the players are in the sleepy town of Big Church. Well, not so sleepy anymore. The forest across the river burned to the ground, the river is filled with sharks. The king randomly appeared out of nowhere in the middle of mass. And the players themselves look like mutants and can't stop talking about nymphs. King Rogbert and his retinue quickly leave town to return to Castleford. Philibert is trying to find a nymph first. We need to beat him, time to deliberate on where to find a nymph. The forest on the west side of the river is gone, Gemnes thinks Duck Lake near Castleford might be a good place to look. Korgrok the wise rolls a one on knowledge nature. He proudly announces that the nymph is located on the top of Mount Disappointment. On the west side of the river. Away from everything the DM planned, 100% sure of it. Philibert rolls miserably on wisdom and believes him, DM shoves all his city and forest encounters in a mental paper shredder and picks out pieces to use in mountain encounters. Early morning in big church. The party goes about preparing for their dangerous mountain climb. Torin is accosted by a street preacher for not washing away his sins in the light of Pella. Torin tries to walk away, but the preacher follows and continues to berate him. Korgrok buys a lucky rabbit's foot from a vendor for a gold piece. Anya talks with a plant vendor who is pretty sure nymphs live in groves, not mountains. She mentions it to the party and is told matter-of-factly that there is a grove on top of Mount Disappointment. Philibert commissions scary-looking robes to wear as the new High Inquisitor of the nymph. He considers getting a blacksmith to hammer his steel fingers into steel sickles. As he is exiting the tailor, a crazy old woman grapples him, certain that he is her long-lost son. Philibert miserably fails the grapple and is dragged away. No one hears his screams for help. The halfling is forced into the old woman's home and force-fed terrible soup. He shoots a wand at her point blank. The old woman is knocked to the floor at one hit point and now has a prehensile nose. Philibert drops the wand and flees the crime scene. Meanwhile, Torin has led the demagogue to Korgrok, hoping that he will focus on Korgrok instead of him. He's not wrong. Korgrok and the preacher get into a shouting match about Pella and the nymph. Philibert shows up. Shouts blasphemer and shoots the preacher. The preacher's is catch on fire. Anya sees the fire, thinks the preacher is a demon, and shoots him as well. Somewhere, the nearest paladin fears combustion unless he gets soaked in water. The preacher dies in the street, his head still on fire. Villagers flee to get the town guard. Korgrok, Anya and Philibert hastily charter a rowboat across the river for 30 gold apiece. They send Gemnes and Torin to retrieve the wagon and join them when they can. Annoyed with the inevitable crime spree, Torin and Gemnes deliberately take their sweet ass time getting the wagon. They stop to get breakfast as law abiding citizens at an outdoor cafe and enjoy the morning. Aside from some old woman with an elephant trunk for a nose screaming at the guards at the top of her lungs about her son attacking her, it's pleasant experience. Riverboat card showdown, Korgrok, Philibert, and Anya ride the rowboat to diplomatic immunity on the other side of the river. It's slow they don't help row, so Philibert asks if anyone wants to play high card, with the deck of many things. Korgrok thinks it's a great idea and draws first. Queen of Hearts. With a mighty thunk, a sylvan scimitar falls from the sky and embeds itself in the boat. Korgrok the nymph has favored me. All hail the nearest nymph. Philibert draws from the deck. Queen of Spades. Philibert permanently has minus one to all saves moving forward. Philibert whelp. Guess we have to draw again, since that was a tie. Philibert draws first. King of Diamonds. With a mighty thunk, a luck blade falls from the sky and embeds itself in the boat. He also gains 50,000 experience points and is suddenly a level 8 commoner. Thankfully the blade contains no wishes. All hail the nearest nymph. Korgrok draws again from the deck. Jack of Diamonds. A dread wraith appears upriver, heading straight towards Korgrok. Rolling on a river. Philibert and Korgrok watch in terror as the dread wraith approaches. Korgrok shoots his wraith. Korgrok grows an additional finger on each hand. Philibert shoots Korgrok's wraith. The Jack of Diamonds specifies that the character must fight the dread wraith alone. If others help, they get dread wraiths to fight as well. There is suddenly a second wraith appears, heading straight for Philibert. Philibert's home is also barricaded in concertina wire. Anya draws a card from the deck and instantly has a permanent 2 to a stat. Korgrok shoots again. Both of the dread wraiths are half height. Philibert thought that the last one duplicated the wraiths, so he stands back and shoots Korgrok. Nothing happens, aside from injuring Korgrok. And filling his house with more concertina wire. Korgrok fires again. Korgrok is suddenly holding an Apple laptop computer in his left hand. Philibert fires. 
All cloth within one mile turns invisible for 56 rounds. The wraiths reach the boat. The DM is ready to kill the two characters when he notices that dread wraiths have sunlight powerlessness. If the creature is in sunlight, it cannot attack and is staggered. The dread wraiths stand directly in front of Korgrok and Philibert, looking rather depressed. Guess we'll have to wait until sundown. Philibert, Korgrok and Anya disembark along with the wraiths. The boat captain rows away, hoping never to see them again. Thus began 5 hours of combat. Some sloppy and quick and probably incorrect DM math. Korgrok and Philibert can only hit a dread wraith on a natural 20. This means out of 20 rounds of combat, they will only hit once on average. A round is 6 seconds. So this means they will hit a wraith once every 2 minutes. The Sylvan Scimitar deals 1d6 3 damage plus an additional 3 damage when used outdoors, so it can deal anywhere from 7 to 12 damage. The Luck Blade deals 1d6 2 damage, so it can deal anywhere from 3 to 8 damage. However, even when hit by magical weapons, wraiths take half damage from corporeal sources. So the Sylvan Scimitar can deal 3 to 6 damage per 2 minutes and the Luck Blade can deal 1 to 4 damage per 2 minutes. Wraiths have 184 hit points. If the players only dealt 1 damage every 2 minutes, that would be 30 damage an hour, which means it would take 6.1333 repeating of course hours to kill a dread wraith. They should theoretically kill the wraith faster than this, because they are dealing more than 1 damage every 2 minutes. But we also have to take into consideration that they will need to take rests and that they could hit a string of bad luck. I'm generous and say it will take each of them 5 hours to finish off a wraith. It never occurs to them to continue using their ones for spells and effects, such as from a magic missile, affect an incorporeal creature normally. We fast forward. It's early afternoon. Korgrok and Philibert have been hacking for almost 5 hours. Sweat soaks their clothes. Korgrok kills his dread wraith slightly faster than Philibert due to the higher damage of his sword. Korgrok goes over to help Philibert finish his off. The Jack of Diamonds specifies that the character must fight the Dread Wraith alone. If others help, they get Dread Wraith to fight as well. A brand new Dread Wraith pops in front of Korgrok. At full health, Korgrok has to swing his sword for another 5 hours, making fort saves versus exhaustion. He barely manages to kill his Wraith before dusk. Gemnis and Torin have finally caught up with their horse and wagon. The party decides to spend the night at the inn in Orother. Korgrok probably can't lift his arms at this point anyway, much less travel. A late night robbery. The DM rolls randomly to select a room and has a thief visit Jemnies in the night. Jemnies rolls very high on perception and Markelrock Hammerschmidt rolls trash on his stealth. Jemnies snaps awake and grabs the mask Markel by the hand. Jemnies what are you doing? Markel shhh go back to sleep, you're dreaming. Markel fails to stab Jemnies with his dagger. He runs out the door. Jemnius grabs a Warhammer and pursues. Markle bursts out of the inn, climbs some crates and starts climbing the roof, Assassin's Creed style. Jemnius follows. Apparently the roof was coated in butter, since both roll out of garbage on climb and nearly fall off the roof. So on top of the inn, there arose such a clatter. Torin sprang from bed, to see what's the matter. Away to the window, he flew in a flash. Tor opened the shutters and threw up the sash. He leaned out the window, and what should appear? But Jemnius and Bandit, struggling in fear. Torin let out a shout and fired a shot. Will it end well for him? Probably not. Torin's mouth and nostrils are suddenly sealed and he is suffocating. Jemnius hears his muffled screams and lets Markle escape into the night. Jemnius rushes in and sees Torin about 10 rounds from suffocating. Jemnius hands him a dagger, but she's too afraid to stab him in the face. Torin stabs himself in the face, opening his airways once more. They stop the bleeding, but it is an ugly wound. He's afraid to get magical healing, lest it reseal his mouth. You wanna know how I got these scars? Dorfhammer Border Patrol. After an uneventful wagon ride in which the party chose wisely not to shoot at a dragon flying overhead, the party arrives at the gates of Dorfhammer, city on the mountain. A steel gate stands locked with murder holes nearby. A dwarven guard appears by the gate and asks them to check their weapons before entering. Phil, but what? How dare you? Korgrok what assurances do we have that the weapons will be returned? The guard tells them that they will promise to the return the weapons. They just can't have armed outsiders in their city. It's never been a problem before. Most of the party agrees. Philibert chews the guard out and swears vengeance but eventually relents. He makes such a fuss. That the guards forget to search the barrel containing their wands. 
Korgok sells his college laptop to a dwarven merchant for six gold and two tin dirtwigs. Philibert and company go to a tavern to recruit a mountain guide and a porter. Two dwarfs are interested, but they start laughing when Philibert mentions a magical grove atop the mountain. Murder glints in Philibert's eyes as he says there better be a glade on top of that mountain. In Dwarvish, Gemnes warns them that Philibert will likely turn violent if no grove is found at the top. In Dwarvish, the two dwarfs thank her kindly for the warning, politely excuse themselves and never return. Philibert well, those guys were jerks. Let's find someone else. In Dwarvish, Gemnes warns every dwarf afterwards, and they all politely turn down the job. After several dozen dwarfs cycle like this, word eventually reaches the town guard. They approach Philibert and politely ask him to leave the city. Philibert goes on a tirade and asks if they are being racist or if they worship the nymph. The town guard is having none of it, and again ask him to leave peacefully. Philibert nearly turns a wand on them, but goes quietly for now. He spends the night outside of Dorfhammer, casting hexes on its walls and marking Dorfhammer for the nymph's retribution. The rest of the party at least gets a map of the mountain sketched while they spend the night. Donna. Party of six. The party hoists the barrel onto Torin's back and marches up the mountain. Korgrok leads the party by immediately failing his survival check. While they certainly go up the mountain, at some point they go off the trail and have no idea where they are. Eventually they find themselves staring at a sheer rock face with no clear path forward. They attempt and fail to climb the rock face with pitons. Jean Chaucer takes over navigation. Let the professional hunter show you how it's done. He also fails his survival check. While they certainly go down the mountain, they don't find the original trail they lost and end up in the middle of the woods somewhere. While debating their next action, they stumble upon three bugbears eating a dwarf. Gemnes and Jean suggest walking away without alerting them. Philibert's player is already pretending to fire his wand with his pencil. Surprise round, Philibert fires. When Philibert dies, no bird can ever sing again within one mile. First round, Anya fires. Anya is now as beautiful as a nymph while sleeping. Gemnes fires. All creatures within 60 yards lose all weapon proficiencies for an hour. The bugbears move twice, so they are now in melee range. Torin fires. His hands may not be burned by non-magical fire. Korgrok fires. His possessions have no weight. Philibert fires. Any food he prepares will be poison. Jean fires. All creatures within 60 yards are standing next to their clones. So now we have 6 bugbears and 12 PCS. Anya Jean Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. His name is his name too. Anya is also thrilled to have a twin sister. Second round. Anya fires. When Anya dies, her body will rise up into the sky. Clone Anya fires. Clone Anya thinks her skeleton is made of glass. Gemnes fires. She will now laugh whenever injured. Clone Gemnes fires. All trees within 60 yards are corroded with rust. The bugbears injure Clonagrock and Torin, but they are not very good with their swords anymore. Torin fires. All cows within one mile have human intelligence. Clone Torin fires. All females within 60 yards believe they are covered in bugs. Korgrok feels the urge to walk on his hands irresistible. Clonagrock fires. His eyes fall out and regrow in 20 rounds but he doesn't know that. Philibert fires. Philibert's stats are all changed to 13, so his clone is now actually smarter and wiser than him. Clone Philibert immediately attacks original Philibert to take his luck blade. Jean fires. His boots turn into wolves and immediately attack him. Clone Jean fires. His age fluctuates wildly with any magical healing. The wolves gnaw on Jean. The battle continues a couple more rounds but the bugbears are clearly losing. One of them can't close their mouth. One of them thinks Philibert owes him a great deal of money, then dies. Torin believes he can sell his boots for 10 times their value. He's probably right, since Jean's boots are wolves. Any fires started within 60 yards of Anya will be cubes, smell of meat and generate sleep smoke. One of the wolves is forced to run away in a straight line for the next 24 hours. All trees within 60 yards of the battle corrode with rust. Epilogue now the players are lost in the wilderness with their identical clones. The homicidal halflings clone also has a luck blade and a wand with 49 charges that can clone all characters within 60 yards. They also still have the deck of many things. I cannot foresee any way in which this ends well. So yeah, I've got some bad news for you. Um, this is the last part of the commoners wand that is written now just 
putting that in there in Ask Chris and all that jazz. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to try and get a hold of him the same way I got a hold of Bram the Honorary Wizard. Hopefully he writes back. Maybe we get another part. That would be great. Um, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm more doing this for myself because I want to find out what's going on next, you know. Uh, that's kind of one of the good things about these. Um, I love reading these sort of stories. Um, I love people like you know getting inspirations like oh i would love to do that myself or yeah i, I that's that's how i would like to do things or i like the writing style or you know i love it so i'm it's just something i'm really into you know if you haven't noticed <laughs> so uh like i'm gonna try and get a hold of him as i say hopefully he writes another priority if he, you know i mean if he does or if he just thinks well there's not much to get like, i don't know, maybe the whole campaign fall, fell apart we don't know but like um definitely subscribe because i don't know when that's going to be um i'm rambling for a bit too much so like um, i'm going to put all the links to if you want to do this yourself like you know the spells um the map shit like that he actually they actually got the map painted so they did so i'm going to throw all that up down below in the description and and uh, maybe you guys would like to try it yourselves. I would definitely love to do this myself. I think this sounds like so much fun. Uh, it's 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 genuinely like, so good. Uh, although I do agree with his way of doing just making the ones point and click to make them work. I think that's oh, you know, I I, I love that because you just don't know where you're gonna go. And uh, look, hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. That's all I can say. And I'll see you later. If you haven't already, check out my Red Bubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!